Stonegate, how are we doing this morning? <clears throat> it is so good to see. If you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 19. It would be so helpful as always to have your Bible out and open on your lap where you can follow along with us. So if you want to turn to Genesis 19, that would be great. And as you do that, let me pray for us, then we'll jump in. <sighs> Father, mo mornings like this, moments like this in our life where we get together with our church family really are gifts from you. And part of what we're doing this morning is reminding ourselves of the most important truths in the universe. So Lord, would you help our hearts be awake to these truths? God, would you give us eyes that could see and ears that would hear and a heart that could respond appropriately today? God, would you help us? And Father, our commitment is to be present here with you, fully present, not an hour into our future, not looking back this morning, but just right here with you, our God. So would you come now and talk to us, your people, and it's in your good name, amen. A.W. Tozer once said that the most important thought you will ever think is the one immediately following the word God. And I think he's right. It is the most important thought that you will ever think. When you hear the word God, whatever fills in right behind it is the most important thing in your life. And here's why that thought is so important. Uh, that thought is showing you your God. Or it's at least showing you what you want God to be like, uh, right? It, it's showing you uh, the sort of God that you have made or fashioned or the sort of God that you see. It's the most important thought about you. And, and here's the danger in that. Genesis 1 tells us that we are, were made in the image of God. So when God made you and me, we were made into his image. So there's something about us that, that is like God. But here is our problem. It's really one way to describe the human problem. Because of sin, we tend to remake God into our image. Refashion God so that he looks a little more like us and what we would want him to look like. We tend to shape God and reshape God until he's just a little more palatable to our taste buds. He's just a little more like the God that we would like to have, right? We have a tendency to, to reshape and shape God until um, God sort of sides with us in all the important issues in our life. Like all the really important thing, God, God agrees with the way that I see these things and think about these things. So rather than changing to be like God, we have a tendency to change God to be like us. Uh, this is one way, again, to describe the human problem. So we should all ask ourselves, where did we get our thoughts of God? If our, the thought that comes immediately after the word God is the most important thing about us, if that's true, it's the most important thought we'll think. If that's true, we should ask, where did we get those thoughts that, that fill in behind that word God? And for many people in our culture, our thoughts of God have been formed by a mixture of things. Uh, we mix a little bit of our cultural beliefs about God to just sort of what our culture has discipled us to think about God. We mix a little bit of that. We mix a little bit about our family of origin and our family's beliefs. And then we dust that with a little bit of the Bible. And now we've got our conception of God, what, what our thoughts are that follow that word God. And we should ask ourselves, how do we... How do we know that the God that we think of is not a made up God? That the God that we have, the God that we see, the God that we, um, the God that we have made is not made up. How do we know that? So imagine for a moment me looking at my beautiful wife, Laura, and saying to her, Laura, I love you. I love that beautiful blonde hair. I love those big, beautiful blue eyes in the middle of me just pouring out my heart to her, uh, telling her how much I love her. She slaps me. And she's like, Rodney, I don't have blonde hair or blue eyes. You're, you're talking about a different woman right now. Just imagine that moment. Now, I think that is an apt metaphor for what we so often do to God. We, we pour out our heart to God. God, I love you. You're amazing. I love those blue eyes and that blonde hair. And God's like, I, I think you've got the wrong God. Right? We tend to remake God into our image. So how do we make sure that we get the right God? Not a made up God, but the right God, like the real God. How, how do we make sure we do that? Well, the only way to do that is to open up the Bible and to read 
all of it, not just the parts that we like and that are palatable to us, but the entirety of the Bible. Because in the Bible, God is revealing himself to us. He's, he's disclosing what he's like. He's showing us what he is like in the scripture. So uh, the way we get the real God is to open up the Bible, read it, and then to ask God to show us who he says he is. That's how we get the real God. In church, our text today is especially helpful for anyone wanting to make sure you've got the right God, like the whole God, right? Not just the God of your making, but, but the real God. This passage is so crucial today. So here's what we're doing today in Genesis 19. We're looking at one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. One of the most sobering chapters in the Bible. But it's a chapter that if we want the real God, it's a scene and a chapter and a text that we need to see, that we need to sit in. So here's what I want to do today. I, I want to try to answer uh, the question of what do we learn here about God in Genesis 19? What do we see about God? What does God show us about himself in Genesis 19? And I've got two things I want you to notice as an answer to that question. Here's the first thing we see about God. First, we see that God is judge. He is judge. It is a somber scene of God's judgment on a people. That's what we're seeing here. It starts in verse 23. And look at what this text says. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew, overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. If we're going to summarize what we just read there, here's the summary. Everyone and everything dies. The cities are overthrown. They're wiped out. Uh, the people, even down to the plants, uh, the people perish. Everyone and everything is dead. And this text shows us God is the one who did it. God is the judge who brought judgment on this city. This text gives us a view of God as judge. And as judge, it shows that God's wrath will one day swallow up every sin and every sinner. That's what we're learning about God in this text. And I know it's like preaching a passage like this. I so feel this just thinking about a moment of me saying God's Judgment is going to swallow up every sin and every sinner. I just feel how our cultural sensitivities are attuned to think that is the craziest thing you've ever heard. Now, R.C. Sproul is right when he says, the great myth of the 20th century, and we would now say 21st century, is that there is no wrath in God. Right? This is part of how our culture has reshaped God. It's created a God with no wrath. With no judgment. It's created a God who just sort of goes along with whatever you think is good. Hey, if you think it's good, I'm sure God would think that's awesome too. Our God is like that in our culture. Reshaped to operate like that in our culture. But this text shows us that's not the real God. The real God has opinions about things. And, and the right opinions about things. And the real God is a judge. And as judge, his wrath will one day swallow up every sin and every sinner. That's what we're seeing in this text. God is judge. Now, we're also learning some things about God's judgment as judge. About when his wrath comes, his judgment comes, what it looks like, what it feels like. And part of what we learn in this text is that it's a just judgment. God's judgment is just. Genesis 19 isn't presenting a capricious God who just sort of loves to throw some haymakers and some uppercuts. That, that's not what you get here. Uh, in, in this text, God is, it's obvious in Genesis 19, God will do that. He will throw an uppercut, but it doesn't come from the deepest places of God's heart. If you look down into the deepest places of God's heart, what you're going to find is a gentle, kind, loving, gracious heart. That's the heart of our God. 
But when that gentle, kind, loving, just heart is provoked by sin, here is what comes out of God, wrath. Now, what is wrath? Wrath is God's settled hatred of sin. That's what wrath is. It's a settled hatred, right? It's not a flying off the handle. It's a settled hatred for sin. And wrath is one of the attributes of of God. It's one of the ways that we describe who God is. God is judge. God is wrath. This is one of the ways that theologians describe God. But although wrath is an attribute of God, it is a provoked attribute of God. The only time you're going to see wrath pop up in God's heart is when it is provoked by someone threatening the things that God sees as precious. So let me put it in illustration for you. Uh, you all know this lady. I guarantee you, you, you know this person. If you'll just sort of roll through the Rolodex of people that you know in your life. You know the gal who is just as sweet as they come. This is the lady that literally, if she kills a mosquito, she's going to feel bad about it. it it's that gal. I mean, she is just the most tender-hearted, gentle, kind person that you have ever seen until you threaten her kid. Then she will kill you without remorse, right? You know that person, and we call that person something, right? They're called a mama bear, right? And that's a picture of God's heart. It is kind, gentle, just, but when you threaten the things that are precious to God, you provoke wrath and judgment in his life, in his heart. So what is provoking God in this passage? Why is this just judgment that we're seeing in in this text? Well, Genesis 18 and 19 use the word outcry three times. And it's saying there is an outcry that is coming up and out of Sodom. And God hears this outcry. That God sees the sin happening in Sodom. Now, what is that sin? Well, the first nine verses of chapter 19 are describing Sodom and the sin of Sodom for us. So here's the the layout in these first nine verses. You've got these uh, two of the three men that show up to Abraham in Genesis 18. They represent the presence of the Lord. Uh, Two of these three men go to Sodom, and Lot brings them into his home. Then you get to verse 4. But before they lay down, uh, before the, uh, but before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Now, here's the point of verse 4. It's trying to help us see that this isn't some of the men of Sodom. It isn't a few of the men of Sodom. This is every man. Every single man that made up uh, Sodom, that man has surrounded, all of those men have surrounded uh, this house. Then you get to verse 5. And they called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. What you have here is high-handed sexual sin. High-handed sexual sin. The the beauty of sex, something that God has made, the beauty of sex has been distorted in Sodom. It's been darkened in Sodom and in the surrounding cities into things like homosexuality, into things like sexual abuse and other perversions. The beauty of sex has been distorted into all sort of perverse things in Sodom. Verse 6, Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Now, on one level, I have a lot of respect for Lot's boldness. He goes out and he confronts the men of the city. So I have respect for that. But I don't have a category for a man who would say, um, just take my daughters. No category for that. Uh, Right? This, This is a picture. Lot is a picture of what a pagan city can do to a follower of God. Lot's sensibilities have been so corrupted in Sodom that rather than dying a thousand deaths to save and protect his daughters, he is sacrificing his daughter to protect himself. Just have no category for that. Then verse 9, but they said, stand back. 
And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you a lot than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. Welcome to the sin of Sodom. Now, if all you had was Genesis 19 to see the sin of Sodom, uh, you might have a tendency to want to look down your nose at Sodom and have kind of this, God, you better go get them sort of posture, right? Uh, but we get, we get a little more, the Bible rounds out some of how it wants us to see uh, the sin of Sodom. And yes, there was all sorts of sexual perversions going on in Sodom, but that is just a slice of the overarching wickedness of this city. Listen to how Ezekiel describes it. This is Ezekiel 16. Listen to how Sodom is described there. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, all the surrounding cities, had, here's the sin of Sodom, pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. See, when you read Ezekiel 16, you begin to see yourself in Sodom. That you kind of fit into this city somewhere. And it begins to dawn on us eventually that God's judgment isn't just going to get Sodom. It's going to get more than Sodom. It's actually going to get us too. It's going to get me too. Do you see any pride in your life? Do you see any excess in your life? Prosperity in your life that has moved you away from the poor and needy? Maybe all the way out into a safe suburb? Uh, do you see arrogance showing up in your life? A self-centeredness and a self-absorption showing up in your life? That's all Sodom. The sin of Sodom. See, what we're seeing in the scriptures is that Sodom is not just an out there thing. Sodom is also an in here thing. And we're seeing in Genesis 19 that God's judgment, his just judgment, is coming for all Sodoms everywhere. It's going to swallow up every sin and every sinner. That's what we're learning about God's just judgment. We also see in this text that it's a patient judgment. God is patient. He's not easily provoked. God's wick is really long. We see this throughout the scriptures. But scenes like this show us that we have become more accustomed to God's patience, so accustomed to God's patience, that we're actually shocked when we see his wrath provoked. See, when we read a text like this, the, the sort of tendency we have when we read this is like, oh my gosh, are we serious? That's in the Bible? There's, there's moments like this where God does these things? But in the scriptures, the Bible is not shocked by Genesis 19 being in there. The Bible is shocked that there are not more Genesis 19 moments in there. That's what is shocking to the Bible and the authors of the Bible. Now, think about this text for a moment. God's wrath, again, it's not, it's not a fly-off-the-handle anger. No, it's God heard an outcry. And then the text in Genesis 18 and 19 is telling us he goes down into the city to sort of check the facts. To make sure that everything has come to him is actually happening in the city. Now that is really just there for our benefit. God knows everything. He doesn't have to go to the city to, to check the facts, right? But, but it's there to help convince you and I that there, are, there will be no false accusations with God. Uh, there's not going to be a person who stands before the Lord and says, Hey God, you know that sin you're accusing me of? I didn't do that. It's not going to work that way. Right? It's just saying God, God knows all of our sin. There are no false accusations here. He is patient in his judgment to make sure he has all the facts, no false accusations. And then he gives Sodom all sorts of time to repent. Do you remember in Genesis 14, the, the four eastern kings, these four sort of mob bosses of, of that day come and they just wreak havoc on the five kings in this area. And they take all the city, all the people, all the plunder uh, back with them. But God rescues the people of Sodom and he does that through Abraham, just giving them time to repent, time to come back to him, time to turn from their sin. You have never met a person more patient than God. He is patient in his judgment. Even now, he is waiting patiently, giving people an opportunity to repent, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 
He's patient in his judgment. This judgment also points us to future judgment. Like everything in the Old Testament, the the judgment of Sodom points us to the future. Uh, The fire of God's judgment in history, right here in Genesis 19, points us to the coming fire of God's judgment at the end of history. When when we'll all stand before King Jesus. And Peter connects uh, this dot for us. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 6, listen to what Peter says about Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. When you read Genesis 19, one of the things it's meant to do for you is to warn you of what the scripture speaks so clearly about that there is a day coming when you will stand before God the judge. Genesis 19 is reminding you of that. That there will be a day where you stand before God the judge. This is where your life is headed. Listen to Jesus talk about this in Matthew 25. He says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, says Jesus, but the righteous into eternal life. That day is out in front of every single one of us. And hear me, it's the biggest day of your life. It is the day, the the big day, the biggest day of your life, which means there's nothing more important than us preparing for that most important day. And there's only two options, the, the scriptures, Jesus says, there's only two options. It is eternal punishment or eternal life. That's the only options when we stand before God the judge. It is either wrath forever or welcome forever. And as sobering as the fire of Genesis 19 is, it pales in comparison to the coming eternal fire of God's judgment. This is what Genesis 19 is meant to point us toward. To get us seeing and recognizing and and thinking about. But we also see in this text that God's judgment is a surprising judgment. Look at verse 14 of Genesis 19. It says, so when Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters up, Get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But then listen to what it says. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They, they, just couldn't, they just couldn't wrap their minds around, God is about to destroy this thing. Judgment is coming. They, they just couldn't see it. They, they just couldn't see that everything was riding on their response right now in this moment. Judgment was coming, but it felt like a joke to them. And... God's future judgment will be just as surprising to us as the fire of God's judgment was to them. Listen again to how Jesus talks about this in Luke uh, uh, 17. He says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. Just another normal day. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What were the people doing in Genesis 19? They're just doing all the things human beings do, right? Normal people do. They're working, they're getting married, they're raising kids, they're eating, they're drinking. They're doing all of that with no thought of the judgment to come. It was a surprising judgment for them. Now, we're not just supposed to see God as judge. There's another thing we're supposed to see in this text. It's not just God as judge. It is also that God is gracious, 
He is so gracious. As sobering as this story is, the main point is not to see God as judge. It's a point, but it's not the main point. The, the main point is to see God as a gracious Savior. The main point is to see God as a God who is willing, who wants, who has the grace to rescue Lot and his family. That's the main thing we're meant to see here. Now, this story shows us the grace of God. And, and it's multiple sort of facets of the grace of God. This story shows us God's grace of protection. Verse 9. Then the, the mob in Sodom, they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break his door down. What saved Lot? What protected Lot here? God's grace. Verse 10. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Have you ever just stopped to think about where you would be apart from God's protective grace in your life? Where would you be? If you are in this room and you made it through your teenage years, there's only one explanation. God's protective grace. Amen? I mean, that, that's it. Where would you be apart from God's protective grace? We see in this passage uh, God's grace of warning. Look at verses 12 and 13. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. It's God's grace of warning. It, it, these men are, are warning Lot, judgment is coming. And, and this text shows us that when the fire starts, it's too late to prepare. It, it's too late at that moment. So it's showing us we have to prepare now. We have to respond now. We have to, to do something now. And friend, this chapter is in the Bible to warn us. It's God's grace, his warning grace to warn us of the judgment to come, to, to sober us up so that that future judgment will not be a surprise to us. Genesis 19 is in the Bible for that as a gracious warning. Uh, to point us to passages like Hebrews 9, 27, uh, where the author of Hebrews tells us, and just as it was appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. That is where history's headed. This is where your life is headed, friend. And the, it's the most important day of your life, the biggest day of your life. And so it means that today, the most important thing you can do is prepare for that day. Uh, are you prepared for that moment? Are you prepared for the moment when you, not you and a collective bunch of people, but you individually stand before God as judge? Are you living like that day is coming, that, that it is out in your future? We also see in this passage the grace of rescue, of God's rescuing grace. Now, think about the time frame here. It's dusk, so right? The, the sun is setting. The men come into the city. They go to Lot's house. And this is when all hell literally breaks loose in Sodom. The town has come for these men. And now God is about to judge uh, Sodom and the surrounding cities. And Lot receives the warning. But the sun is coming up. And with the sun coming up, it's the signal. God's wrath is here. Judgment is right now. The sun is coming up. This is when it's going down. But Lot isn't leaving. He's staying in Sodom. Look at verses 15 and 16. As morning dawned, the sun is coming up. The angels urged Lot saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. It's the second warning from these men. Judgment is coming. Prepare yourself. Get ready. Respond. Then you get to verse 16. But he lingered. What is Lot doing? But, but he lingered. So what do these men do? So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. The Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. Can you just see that picture? It's a family of four. Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. And these two men take one in each hand and they run them out of the city. It is, what we're seeing here is John 6.44 in story form. Here's John 6.44. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. 
Now, that Greek word draw is in other places in the New Testament, like in the book of Acts, translated to drag. Unless the Father drags them to me. That's what's happening in this story. The Lord is dragging Lot to rescue, dragging him to salvation. And friend, if you know Jesus, if you've been rescued by Jesus, this is a beautiful picture of how God being merciful to you has seized you by the hand and and he's dragged you. He's taken you out of destruction and into the safety of his grace. It's your story. Genesis 19 verse 16 is not just Lot's story. It is the story of every human being who has been rescued by God. I want to end with a question and a warning. A question and a warning. Here's the question. When I read this text, one of the things that that sort of pops up, a question that pops up for me is, why in the world did God rescue Lot? I mean, he's, he's not much different than the rest of these guys in Sodom. Why did God rescue Lot? And thankfully, this text doesn't leave us to wonder. It answers the question for us. In verse 29, here's what we read. So it was that when God destroys this, destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham. That's covenantal language. God remembered. He's mine. I've made promises to this man. God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. And again, like everything in the Old Testament, we're meant to see through Abraham to one of Abraham's great, 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 great grandsons all the way to Jesus. Because just like God remembers Abraham and saved Lot, God remembers Jesus His life, death, and resurrection, and saves us. The scriptures are so clear that there's only one reason, and there's only one way that we can be saved. And here's the reason. It's a name, Jesus. That's it. That's the only reason. It's the only way that a human being can be saved. And there's a warning. Some of you know the shortest verse in the Bible. The shortest verse is... Jesus wept. There you go. Yeah, great job. Uh, Now, not everyone knows, though, the second shortest verse in the Bible. We go from two words to three words. And the second shortest verse in the Bible is in Luke 17. And here it is. Remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Verse 26 tells us. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now, commentators are quick to put up, that they are quick to point out that this is not just a casual glance back towards Sodom. This is a longing look that led for Lot's wife to much more lingering outside of Sodom. It's that type of look that led to more lingering. In Mark 12, a scribe comes up to Jesus and he asks the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor. That's the greatest two commandments. And the scribe looks back and says, yes, that's right, Jesus. And then Jesus responds to him this way in in Mark 12. Jesus, it says, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. You're not in it yet, but you're not far from it. You're not far from the kingdom of God. And Lot's wife is a living example of someone who is not far from the kingdom of God. She was out of Sodom, but she was not yet to safety. She was out of Sodom, but she was not yet saved. Remember Lot's wife. I just wonder how many of us are Lot's wife. We've we've taken steps toward Jesus, but we're still not to safety. We've taken steps, but just not the decisive step of throwing the entirety of our life on him. We've taken steps. We're we're even in church, but we're just not the safety. We've not yet been saved. We're not far from the kingdom of God. Friend, if that's you, remember Lot's wife. This is your day to push your life fully in with Jesus. Amen? Why don't you pray with me?
want to give you just a moment to allow the Spirit of God to press down into you what would be most helpful this morning. You know, part of what I love about a morning like this is it does show us what matters most. And when the Lord shows us what matters most, we oftentimes see how we are making little things most important in our life. So, so maybe this is a morning where the Lord just wants to recalibrate everything about your life. He, he's looking at you and just saying, I, I want you to live now for the things that are going to mean most to you when you stand before me one day. Just picture that moment of you before God the judge. What is going to be most important to you then? It's just filling up our life with those things right now. So you can ask just there where you are, God, how do you want me to respond to what I've heard this morning? What's one thing you want me to see? One thing you want me to do this morning? And I just wonder how many of us are in Lot's wife's position. Out of Sodom, but just not yet to safety. So maybe this is your moment where you take that decisive step toward safety, toward saving, toward Jesus today. And he's saying, so ready to save you. You can cry out to him right now in this moment. God, I am trusting Jesus and he will take you to safety. He will save you this morning. And I love that we get to end this moment by taking communion today. And it's a little bit different today. Uh, you should have received cups on the way in. And uh, if you didn't, here in just a moment as we sing, you can grab some. There'll be some up front and some back at the back entrance or exits there. So uh, as we sing, you can grab some. But let me just remind you of who communion is for. It is for those who are in relationship with Jesus. So friends, if you have not taken Jesus, take him before you take communion. Take Jesus first. It's for those who, who know Jesus are all the way to safety. So if you don't throw your life on him, take that decisive step toward him this morning. And it's for those who are in right relationship with Jesus. So is there anything in your life that needs to be confessed to Jesus, repented of? Is there a root of bitterness in you? Is forgiveness towards someone needed? Anything you need to confess to the Lord, it's, it's a call to examine yourself so that you can be in right relationship with him. And then it's a call to rejoice Friends, here is how we are saved from the wrath and judgment to come. It is through the broken body of Jesus, the spilled blood of Jesus. So friends, we have some things to celebrate this morning, don't we? That, that Christ died taking all of God's wrath for our sin so that we can have the welcome of God forever. There's some things to celebrate as we take communion this morning. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to do some of that self-examination. We're going to sing, and then I'm going to come back out here in just a moment and lead you through the taking of communion. So sing with us as you do some self-examination.